Tonight what we're going to be doing is looking over the history of trans rights and trans issues in Ireland. And we're going to stretch back all the way to 1790. Now most of you when you came in would have seen uh, these lovely boards. And they catalog just a few of the great moments in our history. And I think when we talk about trans visibility or trans people, we tend to think this is a rather recent phenomenon. But we can see um, that that is not the case. So I would encourage you at the end of this, if you haven't already, to please check out those and have a read because it tells us our story. And I think um, it's really important that we celebrate our stories as we move forward. So. Without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our first guest of the evening. Um, this year, she's well known to most of you, I think. Uh, she's Kenny's chairperson, but she's also an archivist extraordinaire. So will you join me in welcoming Sarah R. Phillips? Can you hear us? Yeah. Can everyone hear us, yeah? How are you, sir? I'm not too bad, but stressed. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very natural situation. Um, we're hoping to just have a bit of a chat. Um, so I have a few questions, but um, we'll kind of see how it goes. But to kind of kick us off, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the Irish Trans Archive came to be. Um, well, you know, I suppose I've been collecting kind of uh, archival stuff around trans stuff since I was kind of in my mid twenties. I was always cutting out newspaper cuttings. I was trying to find other people and trying to find information about being trans and looking for people like myself or the way I saw myself. So forever, I've always been trying to collate all that and keep it. And the same with photographs. Anytime we would be out, I'd always make sure I had photographs taken, and I would have had hundreds of photographs and kept them. So yeah, I was always interested in looking at other people's stories maybe looking at lives that I wasn't living at the time. So uh, yeah, it's, it's part of that and also my interest in history. And then when you were going through those, and I'm particularly interested in the early days because that's something we never talk about. What are some of the stories that stand out to you from you know, kind of the late 1700s, 1800s? I think you know, in, in a, lot, a lot of what we were doing when, we were, when I was going through a lot of the, the research I was looking for stuff because obviously, you know, we all think trans people have kind of, um, you know, been here kind of the last, since about the 60s or 70s or whatever. But, you know, there is clearly evidence as we know worldwide, uh, trans people going back even further than that. Um, okay, you can't hear me down in the back and that's unusual. <laughs> Let me see, can I get it closer? It's going to fall in the Is that better? Okay, sorry Gordon, normally I shout and I'm trying to avoid it. Um, so yeah, so I, I was looking, I went looking for, I suppose specifically stuff as far as I could go back, as far as I could go. And in, in that research, I mean, I suppose I came across people like Michael Gillen in the 40s and then started looking back further. I think what really intrigued me was, I suppose, initially to even push it back with two specific gentlemen, uh, Albert Cashier and Edward de Lacey Evans. Um, you know, when you go looking for those two, when you actually, even if you Google them now, the everything you find on them, all the information you find on them, are clearly they're very proud men. You know, and even the photographs that we have today, they're very, very proud men. And yet, as you dig into their stories, then it becomes heartbreaking when people eventually find out uh, that they are trans. But they've clearly lived a, li a long life, uh, you know, in the gender, in their preferred gender. Um, you know, and I suppose, what it, what, and then again, of course, being female, you know, I was looking for a similar, where are the females, because obviously I was coming across quite a lot of males, um, which is kind of unusual, um, but the evidence was there around the men, but there didn't seem to be that much. And, you know, while, you know, there is evidence around things like, uh, you know, the gay clubs, which were known as Molly Houses and that in the 1800s, you know, about, Kind of uh, trans women or, or even gay men pretending to be women, whichever, um, there was no clear evidence of any individual you could talk about. And then I stumbled across Eliza Edwards. And I think Eliza Edwards, to me, probably epitomizes the whole of this archive. 
because this young woman was born in Abbey Street in 1790. She transitioned at the age of 12. Um, her peers, her parents knew, her parents, her father was a gunsmith in Abbey Street, but her mother put her on the stage very early at, at around the age of 12, 13. And it was, you know, it's quite an interesting kind of story because at those ages of 15, 16, there's a lot of uh, reviews of her work and she's constantly being told, uh, you know, you're constantly being reviewed as a brilliant singer, um, as a brilliant actress. Um, until then, some young man comes from Drogheda and kind of steals her thunder, you know, but, but it appears she's the star of the Dublin stage for quite a long time. Um, however, you know, like everybody, I suppose, you try to make your life better, you try to move on, and, um, you know, in her case, she decided where was the big stage, the big stage was in London, so she moved to London, um, but she wasn't as successful over there. And, you know, she fell in hard times. Um, she eventually ended up in prostitution. Um, you know, basically sometimes selling herself for just a glass of beer or a glass of wine. Um, and it was only until after, um, you know, she died uh, that they actually found out that she was trans because her body wasn't trained and it was sent to guys' hospital. So I suppose from my point of view that, again, we come back to this probably horrific ending because this is where, that was where I came in, that's what I found. What I found was actually the coroner's report. And the coroner's report of the time is quite horrific. You know, the coroner states that uh, she died of a visitation of God. <laughs> I mean, it's horrific. And also that, you know, that the, um, the authorities should dispose, dispose of her body, um, you know, um, in a means fitting of such an, or a horrible crime. So having spent like 44 years, well, 32 years of her life, uh, you know, very reasonably successful and reasonably, I suppose for the best part of that was happy, because only in the later years she moved to London, that, you know, this was not a nice thing. I'm, I am struck by that. I remember watching a video about, it was Albert Cashier, yes. recently one of those short videos that people put online. And it is that kind of similar, similar narrative where people were living their lives um, as who they were and authentically, and then there's sort of this discovery period at the end of their life, perhaps in their death or, or when they become unwell. And as a trans person, it's, it's quite horrific, I think, to kind of see that experience for people. And I wonder, in terms of you know, where we're sitting now and reflecting on that, like what do these stories tell us or, or what can we kind of take from that? Because obviously, History is so important, and yet, you know, there is this real theme of tragedy. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, it's not that long ago that these stories were, you know, I suppose happening as well. I mean, we're not that far away from, you know, the seventies or eighties or whatever, you know. And, and we've spoken to a number of trans people who have said even back then they were, you know, put through aversion therapy, for instance. Um, you know, so it's not that long ago. It's in our own history, and um, but I do think that. You know, I, I think it was probably um, the way society saw people who were different. You know, I mean, obviously, people they saw people who were gay the same way in some similar situation. But I think being trans back then was actually even more horrific. You know, again, what you mentioned about Albert, uh, you know, Albert Cashier's story is is such a wonderful story in lots of ways because you know here he was a hero of the war, um, you know, decorated. Uh, you know, everybody said he was a very small man, but a very brave man. Um, you know, there's some great stories around what he did. He clearly moved back then after the war, after the American Civil War, um, you know, into his own little town. He was celebrated as just being a cantankerous old fella, you know, who everybody kind of, the kids stayed away from, but, you know, uh, everybody liked him. He was a gardener and stuff. And even I, I, I was struck as well, I know I, we came across, myself and Fanula when we were doing some of this, we came across a, a, um, an audio piece, the radio piece that was done by the local radio station um, back about 10 years ago when they were, they have actually rebuilt his house and his house is now a local monument. Um, they've taken down the gravestone and they've put his actual name, Albert Cashier, on the gravestone. But they interviewed a number of years ago, a very old woman who would have been a child when Albert was just before he died, and she was kind of saying, you know, oh, 
Um, it's funny that uh, you know everybody just saw him as as Albert. Nobody, even when all this news came out, nobody knew um, that it didn't matter that he was uh, this other person that they thought he was, but that they actually thought he was very much Albert, and that's the way they wanted to keep that memory. That's the way they saw it. But he ended up in a asylum. He ended up being made to wear dresses. He was made to behave like female, and. You know, it broke him in the end, and it's it's a similar story with Edward De Lacy Evans. You know, he's some of the photographs of him from the asylum is clearly a very broken man. You know, but yet if you look at the photographs we have of him, he's a very proud man. You know, very very proud man, and you know, it, it is it's harrowing. But that story, as you said, has come forward into you know even into the 70s, 80s, sometimes in some ways. But today. You know, I think we're in a much better place. And also, you were telling me earlier that there is a link um, to 1916 in America. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, we, we actually haven't put it into what's on presentation here today. But um, again, we were working through some, some links that we had come across. Um, and back in 1916, a woman by the name of Eva Gore Booth, uh, who was Countess Markovich's sister, um, along with her partner, Esther Roper, and another person called Irene Troy, who turns out to be a trans woman from Manchester, started a, a journal in 1916. And, and that particular journal uh, was fed around the world, 250 copies, for nearly 30 years. Um, but the purpose of the journal, it was called Urania, which was the word for kind of other gender or homo, even for homosexuality, but it was for other gender specifically. And the purpose of the actual um, uh, uh, journal was actually to gather together stories from around the world uh, of people who were uh, living their lives as the gender opposite to what they were being, uh, you know, recognized as in birth. So, and a lot of it was around essays that they had wrote um, you know, I was, I was reading something that uh, it, it by accident came across. That uh, there's a brilliant book by Sonia Tiernan, who was a, used to be a law um, a professor over at UCD, but she's now in Liverpool. She wrote an art, a book about this, about Esther Roper and uh, or Esther, yeah, Esther Roper and uh, Eva Gorbuz. And in one of the paragraphs, it's called "It Can't Be That Easy to Construct a Man." And it's it's very much around their, how they look at gender and how they look at what is initially, um, you know, uh, recognised as female gender, but people who are living their lives in a male gender. And, and it's quite interesting. So, and their purpose in life, this journal's purpose in life, was actually to change society's idea of gender. Um, which is quite ironic, uh, you know, in, in back into where we are in these days. But it was actually very much around trying to get society to break this idea of the binary gender and to remove it from the thought process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's where we are these days, you know, even with non-binary and well, the, where we're looking for, where the trans community is going. Actually, this uh, journal was very much being circulated around the world by an Irish woman uh, you know, born in Sligo, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what year was that in? Your that was start. It was started in 1916. It started in February 1916, and the, it, it continued for about six years after Eva Gorboot's death. But um, for the best part, she was the editor, and she wrote most of the editorial. She wrote most of the thing. But it finished in 1942. That's incredible. It's both, um, I don't know, kind of inspiring in that way that those are conversations that have been happening for the last hundred years and also slightly depressing that we're still having these conversations. Yeah. I, think, I think it's also uh, you know, interesting that this idea was actually being promoted by an Irish woman. Mm. You know, and I think that's the focus of our, our archive. And, and do you imagine then some of these stories, because I think for most of it, myself included, I haven't, you know, we haven't heard these stories at all. Do you see this archive project as a way of, I suppose, injecting these back into other narrative, like Irish history or the LGBT history or whatever, because these voices are very silent. Like, what would you imagine? Yeah, I mean, I, look like? I think I think one of the things we're trying to do, you know, obviously what we've presented here over the last week, um, you know, is only a snapshot 
Um, we've got, we've picked kind of, I suppose, to a certain degree, six pioneers, but yet there's probably a lot more. And we're, we're quite well, you know, we all know that kind of the, the later years, I suppose, within the last 10 years anyway, I suppose the trans narrative will go into Irish history anyway, because it will have to, it'll go into what's happening in the last year and that. But I think there are also people, there's a big gap between that, you know, 1946 and Michael, um, Michael Dillon, um, and also, uh, it's not going to go any closer. Well, such a lot of the six pioneers. Huh? The six pioneers and how? Yeah, sorry. Um, there's obviously, you know, in fairness, there's a large gap between, you know, uh, for people who we probably chose initially for the more recent uh, pioneers, but there are, there's lots of other people between that 1946 and kind of 2007, 2008. And I mean, some of them are here tonight, so I'm, you know, and I think they deserve to be going into that that archive as well as pioneers as well. But I think we were just trying to uh, give it a snapshot at this stage. But I do think at some point, once we've kind of brought together that, um, you know, that kind of full picture, um, I think maybe, yes, then it needs to go into the national narrative because trans people for so long were silent and so long were in the shadows and so long being treated in a horrible way. So I think in some ways, you know, great, the wider society needs to hear this narrative, not just that we've all of a sudden appeared in the last 10 years. Definitely. And where do you see the archive going from here? Well, I mean, as I said earlier, we, we've, we've just started, we've been working on it for a while now, but, you know, we, we know we're quite aware that there are huge gaps. We know, uh, you know, and Anna and I would echo kind of Tony Walsh's area, our conversations in, within the Queer Archive. You know, there are, there's lots of information out there, there's lots of documents, there's lots of paperwork, there's lots of photographs, sitting in people's attics sometimes, people in people's, um, you know, uh, in their presses or what have you, and we'd like to get hold of some of them, we will, you know, get copies of them or whatever, and I think what we want to do is eventually get to the point of having a full, proper archive exhibition that, you know, in, in uh, maybe in some uh, exhibition centre or whatever, because I think that story is, is much broader than just what we've presented here today. You know, there's a great stories going back to the 60s and 70s and 80s, which again, as I say, we've presented little bits of here. I think, you know, even, even within the social scene in the 90s and in the early 2000s, there's some really great stories there, some great characters, some great people. So I think, yeah, I think what we're looking for, this is very much the launch of the archive. Um, so, you know, I'm putting that call out to you all out there and everybody else. Um, you know, if you have something you want to share, some people have already done that. If you want something that you want to share, you want to let us, you know, get hold of. And I think we'll also probably at some point look to try and do some audio uh, archiving. So we'd like to do some interviews with some people who, you know, have a story to tell. Um, so I think it's going to be a longer project. I think maybe, you know, the exhibition's probably going to be nearly, possibly nine months, a year away. But the hope is to make it a bigger, a bigger event and bigger. Um, and if anybody is interested, Irish Trans Archive at gmail.com. Just get in touch and we can, we can get in touch and have a chat and see what we can do. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I think that the archive is an absolutely fantastic project and I think it's going to be something that we'll be adding to for years. So can we get a big round of applause for Sarah? <laughs> Um, okay, so we have a very quick musical interlude. Can I please have Holly Cooper come up, who's going to perform an original composition from her latest CD. The song is called Hello, um, but it is her hello. Uh, and the CD is called Roller Coaster Historian. Can we give Holly a round of applause?
much energy But just to try it and you will see Hello, 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 hello It's a conversation starter There's no denying that You can say it to anyone And they might even say it back to you so Friends of Ian. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes it's spoken about or it's kind of whispered about, but I wasn't really sure um, what it was or what it meant. And I think there's probably people in the audience who feel the same. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I will. Look, but before I go into that, can I just say, I thought I'd be greeted and brought to the green room. <laughs> uh, and I'm very disappointed that that didn't happen so we could get tanked up before yeah, this. In fairness, the wine is free. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, Friends of I am. Uh, there was a, an organization in London called the Beaumont Society. And back in 1977, I went with others, a few others, to a ball in London. Uh, the, the Beaumont Society annual ball. And interestingly enough, the Beaumont Society was founded by a Dubliner a woman named Alga. And Alga founded the Bowman Society from Dublin. That's how things were back then. We, we weren't visible. And we didn't want to be visible, by and large, because we were very nervous. Um, anyway, in 1978, I went to another ball in London. And uh, came back, and two of us wondered, what are we going to do from now till this time next year? So you met another Irish person in, at the ball in London? I had known the same person in Dublin. And uh, we, we um, there was a magazine around called In Dublin, and we got ourselves a copy of the In Dublin, we went to a famous uh, pub, gay pub, called Barclay Duns, which is more or less where the break for the border is now. And we wondered how we could organize ourselves that we could do something between now and the ball next year. And we noticed an ad that indicated 
lesbians were meeting in a place called the Parliament Inn. And the Parliament Inn is where the Turk's head is right now. So we thought, well, the owner of that must be liberal enough. So up we went to the Parliament Inn and uh, we met the owner, explained that we represented a, an organization of trans people. We didn't. Um, and that we wanted to hold an event weekly, in, if we could, in that establishment. He agreed, and so started uh, a weekly Thursday night meetup in the Parliament Inn on the top floor. Um, <clears throat> we we advertised in, in, in Dublin, and in fact the ad is outside um, and it finishes with, come dressed if you like. In those days, we didn't have uh, a mixture of uh, uh, genders. Um, we were, I suppose you could say, exclusively uh, transvestites or transgender women. So uh, that's how Friends of Eon co commenced. And, uh, the Aeon is actually the first name of Chevalier Aeon de Beaumont, who was a French, uh, uh, who was in the French court of Louis XV, I, I think. Um, so that was the beginning of uh, Friends of Aeon. That's an incredible. Um, that's kind of it's an incredible story in terms of how people found each other. And I remember talking to you, Danny, about first meeting Claire and. Because I suppose from my generation and under, we grew up with the internet, uh, we grew up with a lot more trans visibility, but can you talk a little bit more about those early days and how you found each other? Yeah, well, I, I uh, saw uh, a small article that's outside in the, in the back of the Sunday Independent, and it, uh, it was uh, plucked from in Dublin because uh, uh, the columnist thought it was funny. Uh, um, uh, it, it said it, uh, it picked out that, that there was an ad for a disco for transvestites, which finishes up, come dressed if you like, as Claire said. And of course, when I saw that, you know, I, I knew exactly, I knew exactly what it was. And uh, my next problem was getting in Dublin because I was living in Wexford, and it didn't sell in Dublin in Wexford. But eventually, I found it and got the, got the number uh, to me and. Uh, met Claire, and that, that was uh, late 1978, and in 1979 I came up to Dublin and, and uh, made my way to the Parliament Inn. And, and what was, I, I suppose, I mean, you know that I've only lived in Ireland for the last five or six years, um, I think there's probably lots of people here who um, weren't perhaps of age in the 70s or 80s. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what Ireland was like for trans people at that time? Well, you didn't put your head above the parapet. Well, most of us did. There, there, there were one or two. There was a, a, a trans woman who, who uh, appeared on the Late Late Show in uh, around 1978 or 79. Uh, the same person was a member of, of Friends of Aeon and uh, um, lived near me at the time. And I, I used to give her a lift home and um, she'd uh, we'd get stuck in traffic on Dame Street and she'd call over somebody that she knew. The two of us were dressed and have a chat and, you know, I keep my head down, you know, but, you know, apart from that person, there was very few, there was very few around that was, would have been prepared to, uh, uh, you know, to admit to anybody. Um, when, when we got to, stay, a couple of individuals got brave and went out. I think they went to Captain America's first and then we started going to a pub and, in um, Dame Street, uh, uh, it was a gay pub called The Viking, probably the second gay pub in, in, in Dublin. But we used to go individually, one by one, put our heads down and roll, you know, until, until we got there. You know, so because that, that, that was the atmosphere, you know, um, it, you, didn't, you didn't feel safe, to, to, to put it bluntly, you didn't feel safe. And was the LGBT or gay community, in any ways, it, it's kind of come up through what you're talking about, but would those spaces have been open to trans people generally or, or not? 
they were, they were, there weren't very many spaces. There was a disconnect. So, sorry, there was a disconnect between the gay community and, if you like, our organisation of trans people. Um, that it later uh, improved, um, and there was we, some of us would brave enough would go to the Hurstfield Centre in Temple Bar, uh, which was uh, founded uh, oh, way back even before uh, we we existed. Um, but we 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 developed a dialogue, um, uh, which kind of bridged the gap somewhat. Um, but nevertheless, we remain separate from the gay community. Yeah. It could be said that it was partly our fault as well, you know, because uh, um, okay. maybe more our fault yeah. than, than the gay community, because at, at the time, at, at that time in, in the 70s, um, uh, you know, to, to our shame, we didn't want to be uh, anybody to think that we were gay. Because you know it was bad enough uh, um, being trans, but we were discovered to be gay as well. You know that was uh, that, that was that. Unfortunately, you know that's 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 the society we lived in, in, in uh, at that time. I, I you know we, we talk about the, the Roman society. The Roman society was uh, was for heterosexual uh, transvestites and transsexuals. That was that was uh, the title. You know. It's interesting given that we talk about LGBT and historically, you know, certainly from an American context with Stonewall, we think about all those letters being together. So it's interesting to hear you talk about the 70s and 80s, how there were kind of diverging paths in that way. And then over the years, I suppose it's, we've come back together a bit more. Yeah, very much so. I remember being involved in dialogue in relation to that. Um, and it did improve things. And, and as I say, some of us would go to the Hurstville Centre and we would go to films that were on there and so on. Uh, and we would have been known, uh, you know, to, to the gay community. But still, there was a standoff, kind of, in relation to it. As Danny said, uh, dare anybody think we were gay, you know. <laughs> But when uh, most of us thought we were heterosexual or something, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous when you look back now, uh, the way everything has developed in, in the meantime. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh. When you look back then over the last 40 years or so, and this is, I suppose, a very broad question, but, you know, particularly perhaps maybe for younger activists or people coming out now of whatever age, what is it that you would like people to know from that era? Because I think it's so incredible that you were there at the Vanguard so many years ago. Yeah, but as Danny said earlier, we, we, we were fearful. We were, we were scared. We were scared to be seen walking down the street. Uh, and we, we came up with all kinds of plans to uh, not be seen, <laughs> you know, and with the head down as you were walking really fast to get from A to B, that kind of thing. Um, but. I mean, it was so difficult. Uh, I created a telephone line for Friends of Ian in my own office. And um, people were instructed to ring it on, the, on uh, Thursday evening between 6 and 8. And I can tell you that that phone rang incessantly for those two hours, and very often before 6. Um, that didn't mean that we had loads of people coming along to our uh, Thursday night wasn't the case uh, because transvestites and tra transgender people were scared stiff to come out and that was the reality of the situation back then um, to, so there's no comparison between what we endured then and what uh, people can do today uh, simply no comparison um, all the better for it. Can I just say that there were a couple of brave souls like Claire, who um, who went on uh, radio and on television uh, around 1979-1980, and uh, you know it was it was a very brave thing to do uh, in those days. Great, thank you both so so much. Uh, I think we're all indebted to all of the work that you've done over the last 40-ish years. So thank you very much. Can we get a round of applause for all of you? Maybe you could.
start us off by telling us a little bit about how the Gem well, what the Gemini Club is. I imagine most people know, but maybe I th yeah, I think most people probably know. Probably most. Um, it started out purely as a business venture by a Dublin couple, as a cross dressing service it would be for the guys to come in, dress. We would supply the makeup, the wigs, the clothes, the shoes, the whole lot, and then they could just stay there and relax. And that was in daytime from 12 to 6. But then when a lot of people started coming in, they didn't want to go home. <laughs> so we started having maybe a later evening, later night, and then that developed into a social night once a week. Okay. And then that developed into that, to going out, going out for meals, going to bars, going to Manchester, London, Gran Canaria. And that was over a couple of years now. Because at that time, a lot of them would be terrified to go anywhere. So we went out as a group. And Gemini was a safe, secure, discreet, discreet place for them to come and dress and, I suppose, stay hidden. And has Gemini always been in the same place then? Yeah. For yeah, that for 20 place, years? Yeah. 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 Well, because I was struck by what Danny and Claire said just around that visibility of being so fearful. And I think the Gemini Club played a really special part in that to give people a space when there hadn't been a space before. Um, I suppose when you reflect back to the kind of mid 90s, like, what people were coming, they were getting dressing services, they were getting support and all of that. But I suppose, could you tell us a little bit about what that might have looked like for people or, or what that meant for people? Oh, um, coming in? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of them were married, a lot were in relationships. They wouldn't have um, the facility to dress at home, obviously, because it wouldn't be accepted. So when they came into the club, they had everything there for, for them. And we to stay there and dress and be feel safe. You know. and, and would you make a distinction, because I know ten, at Tenny we use the word trans or transgender as an umbrella term and we use it to include all kinds of identities um, and language over the last say, 20 or 30 years has changed, yeah. but who, who were the people coming to the Gemini Club? Was it most transvestites, trans, like what? What we call trannies, yeah. trannies was the word that we yeah. used because it was a fun word, yeah. but mostly trannies, yeah, there were some TS is okay. But um, you'd have to dig deeper into that to find out, but most of them are trans, yeah. Okay. And Marianne, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experience, because you came out in the 90s, I believe, and... is that true? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, 1990, I came out. 1990? Yeah, I joined the Friends of Home, that time. And then, um, I just said, I've actually just left um, uh, my home, like, you know, moved out of my home. And um, I'd read an article back in 1997, in the the Sunday Tribune, about uh, the Friends of Ale. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, go on. And yeah, I've been, I've been, well, part of the since I was a child, like, you know, and so the friends of Aeon, um, you know, the same way they go to me, other people, you know, and such. So, um, as I say, I left home in 1990 and I went out in the flat, you know, and I made contact with the friends of Aeon. You know, they used to have um, an interview with me in um, the Paramount Deal. I think it was once at the end of every month or something. So I went down to the interview. And I uh, was interviewed by Mary Agnew, because she was the president at the time. So uh, she told us a little bit. And, and what would the interview consist of? Uh, just. Not a crap for me, you know, you just could have a crap. Did you like the look of your much of a you know? Okay. And uh, anyway. Mary just said, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so sorry, you had to go, you had to be interviewed before you could tell it? You had to be, well, that was the general. A lot of people just seemed to be in. I did an interview with them, I had to be interviewed. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Make sure you were trying to get um, Mary said, me, okay, and you know, you can bring up the number. I don't know if she gave me the number, it was in Dublin. She had a copy of the in the front of but it was a few years old. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, the next round of the number, you know, when he said he had the interview, but the um, person that was the room was saying, well, she was very scared of him, bringing me down now. So I ended up having to go back to the parliament for another interview, and I was interviewed at the time. So Danny interviewed him? Well, Danny more or less said, uh, yeah, Danny interviewed me in about 10 minutes. And I said, I'd been there and met Mary the week and rang up and, you know, and Danny more or less said, oh, yeah, okay. Um, Danny was getting back into the scene at the time, um, but um, I think she'd had to leave it, but she'd had to lay off dressing for the world bank, doesn't matter. But anyway, I went back up, went to his house up in Haysbury Street. And actually, I was living, I moved into a flat in Hampton Street, so it was very really handy for me. But anyway, you um, know, I rang the bell, I was downstairs in the basement of the house, I rang the bell, uh, I don't know, it was like a home in the world, it was a home in the world, yeah. And the, the um, TV interrupted in the door, it was um, so an elderly person, you know, and says, Oh, yeah. And, you know, it was, um, that was great, that's what I know. But no clothes, like, the, the friends of Aiden had to be ready in my clothes, you know. So they didn't know about you. But, uh, so after a couple of weeks, I had enough clothes to go out to go. We used, we used to go down to um, Parliament Dean. Uh, down with the Parliament Dean clothes, you know, some of us used to go out to Hooray Henry's, yeah. and I think that's in Paris Coat. So, then <clears throat> I joined the group in, I think it was June or July. Anyway, that October, we uh, organised a um, trip over to Manchester. So, uh, the Manchester Concord group was celebrating, I think, 20 years or something of their existence or whatever. So we went on to that. And it was great getting out, you know. And um, going out shopping. It's on family, we're going for a little female. And um, it's great just passing as a woman, you know. And you know, nobody's big, you know, and you just sort of blend in, you know. But anyway, um, what can I say? <laughs> After that. Um, and things went down with that, you know. We used to start uh, going on trips and, you know. So, um, it can't, we don't have any real, um, it was, it was a lot easier for us to say people who care and don't do that, you know. And the others would have laid the groundwork for sort of rescues, you know. But like, you know, I came out in 1990 and say, but, like, 1993, you know, we got rid of stupid laws against homosexuality and all that. So things started going in that mode, but in the liberal in the country, you know. And just so rolled on from there. Really. Um, um, I don't know what to say. It, it just, it seems that now on one hand there was still a lot of secrecy, right, when you're talking about doing these interviews, but on the other hand, there seems like there's a bit of an emergence as well of people going out, shopping, dressing, yeah. passing, living. Yeah, well, there were still people who were very sick and were very, and were very, very frightened of it, you know. And there were a lot of, pe lot of people who had problems with, you know, the married people and the wives I found out about it. And it didn't work out, you know, for a lot of things like it was, the Lord went to have to say no, you know. And um, there was a lot of people who used to just pass through the, the friends of being the transvestor and scene in general, like, you know. The Lord of people to come on the scene and be very, very active on the scene for a few years. And then suddenly, boom, they just disappear, you know. And suddenly we say, oh, we and that sounds so sorry, so on. You're saying, well, what are you doing now? Well, they just stopped and, you know. And do you ever come across them now, as many as? You still do, yeah. Like a lot of them, for a lot of them, it's like a phase to go through. 
Then that was something they did want to just say they want to get an older system or something. And they, they enjoy it. They come on the same for a few years and they have a great time. And they do everything that, you know, the trans young, the trans, the team they can do, like, you know, um, go on trains, as women, well. go on car friends, you know. They've been here, you know, like, got the t shirt to the day. Okay. And so, the, yeah. And then, Natalie, in terms of, I suppose, the last 20 years, anything back to, say, the mid 90s, in your opinion, or, or kind of through your experience, what what do you think have been the most dramatic changes in terms of the trans community in that time? Or what have you seen? Well, they come out more naturally, you know, they don't have to hide. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can go to town, they can go into bars, restaurants, they don't have to go to a dressing service and dress there. You know, they can actually go out and be accepted. A lot of their families accept them now, whereas years ago they couldn't tell their families. They couldn't tell, you know, their wives or their partners or mothers, fathers. Nowadays they can. It, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the Gemini Club then probably played that role for a lot of people in a way that things have changed in the, in the last while in the sense of playing that supportive family essentially to a lot of people if they had nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had to know, I think about twice, three times during the years, I had a couple come in with their child. Mm. Now, this is going back 18 years ago. Right. I had a phone call from a couple and they said their son wanted to dress and liked to dress and uh, they were terrified, like, what was the problem? And I said, there's no problem. You know, that's natural for that person. So they came in with him, and they let him get dressed in the club, and we went through the whole thing, what it meant, what it didn't mean, and they were delighted, and they left. I never heard anything back. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what happened. But the mother and father were thrilled that they were able to understand, or try to understand what was going on with the son. Which is just really incredible that, I guess, maybe counter to some of the things that Claire and Danny were talking about where it seemed unimaginable that you would have a situation. And I know now, in 2016, we're having more and more families who are embracing um, yeah. their children as well. And, you know, this it's seen as part of human diversity, or we're moving towards that phase of it's yeah. seen as part of human diversity yeah. as opposed to something that needs to be hidden away. Thank God. I mean, we had, um, like, North Fairfax Street is in the main street. So we used to uh, go through the main hall door on the street. Now we're in the basement. So we used to go to the main hall door. And people said, no, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Somebody might see me on the bus. Somebody might be driving past. So we had to close the main door and let them come in through the basement. And they'd only come down to the basement because there was uh, boardings on it. So once they're down the first step, nobody could see them. And they'd belt down the stairs, back on the door, open the door, open the door, let us in. Terrified, absolutely terrified. No, it's not like that anymore. Most people. Most people. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you both so much uh, okay. for speaking to us. And can we get a big round of applause for <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to move on through the years, and next up is the one and only Vicky Mullen. So Vicky, can you come on up? Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> Vicky gets to be on her own. Of course. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm doing the Middle Ages. Sarah did the ancient <laughs> history and it's moving down, you know. <laughs> You're getting to the young people now. That's it, no. that's it. Um, I suppose, just thinking about that, so we've gone through many decades, we're flying through them, um, but you were there right from the beginning of Tenny, um, and Tenny, for those of you who don't know, I assume you all do, is Transgender Equality Network Ireland, and uh, we were born in 2006, although this is up for some debate, um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about those years. But can I go back to yes. the 80s first, Definitely. just briefly? Because I had a brief flirtation with the of Eon, then it, friends of Eon, and they were talking about interviews, and this is what reminded me, because I'd have been about 19, maybe 20, when I first joined that, and I had to do something like two interviews to get in, and then another interview to meet the only person I really wanted to was Claire. I met Claire, because we were the only TSs in the, in, at the time. 
Everybody else was TV, transvestite. We were transsexual. Such a much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but I found, and there's a big debate now about the uh, Eighth Amendment. And when I first met, it was our, the male, the old male versions of us, oh. you know. And uh, we met inside the Shelburne Hotel, petrified that anyone would see us. And what year is this? This would have been around 1983, and it was around that mostly I met Claire. And because um, I was an aspire, I was aspiring to transition, and I'd never met another transsexual before, as as we were then called. And um, but while we were outside, there was this big crew of pro-lifers shouting for it to to bring in the Eighth Amendment. So to see how far we've come, and yet the country is still. Going on about <laughs> the same thing. 35 years. It's years. Yeah, not far enough. Anyway, back to 2000. So then, how did you, so if that was sort of your first foray into trans issues or trans identity in, say, the early 80s, how did you end up back into it in the 2000s? Well, so yeah, I did transition in 84 to 85 for a while. It didn't work out. I tried to be what I imagined as the perfect woman, and that included being shy and demure and quiet. And I wouldn't be known as particularly quiet, so it didn't work out. It took me a while to figure out why it didn't work out. So I went back to make my family happy, and then I went straight for about 20, 24 years or something like that. 20, 1985 to, yeah, almost 20 years. And then 2004 I cracked and I started going out on my own, but I couldn't find a community. There was no trans community that I could find. Back then, it took me nearly a year, and then the Dublin support group was set up by Jill Dalton. And on the first night, I met Sarah. I think the second night, Philip attended. And Deanna was there the first night. <laughs> Not sure if anyone else here was there the first night, but anyway. And um, ironically, I went in the hope I'd meet somebody who'd tell me how to hold it together, because I didn't want to transition. <laughs> I wanted to stay married. So, the support group, saved, well it certainly saved my life, and um, there was a few of us there at the time, and uh, Philip, and we wanted to put something back in, so Tenny kind of grew out of that, Tenny was an organisation that had one kind of renegade member down in Cork, and it was an organisation, and we were determined we wouldn't have splits, so we decided we joined that organisation. That organization was one person. But why did you feel the need to split off from the support group? Well, we wanted to, and, and that would have been a <laughs> serious impact. We didn't want to have the support group politicized. The support group was there for support and should be about nothing else. And we're proud we've kept that to this day. The support group is independent. It's there purely for that one purpose. And that really was one of the main reasons one person that I got involved with find found in Denny was to make sure that that would survive in Dublin and we'd hope extend it down the country, which we successfully did. And then there was the rights issue, and for me there was the education issue as well, in that if society got educated, maybe they wouldn't be so hard on us, and more particularly in my case, on my kids. I, I want to see a more open society, and we've had success beyond our dreams. Certainly still the ethos of telling them as well. It Education is, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. key. It's a key part, because that's, that's what makes life easy. So that was late to that was a, an infamous trip to Vienna. And that was for the first TEG, TGEU meeting. And, uh, Which is a transgender Europe. Yes. And uh, I think myself and Philip were very serious about the politics. And some others were not so serious. <laughs> At the time, look at her now. Look at her now, yeah. So, out of that, then definitely grew ten, because you know we came back with the bit between our teeth, and I was about to transition. It was coming up with all that hassle was going on in my life, and uh, like I would have transitioned around the beginning of May two thousand six, but we'd had the first tenny meeting, official meeting, it was down in I think Horse and Jockey. We met halfway between Cork and Dublin. There was five of us, Jill Dalton, who had set up the support group, myself, Linda Sheridan, and um, uh, Karina Burns was there as well. 
There's actually a poster up there that commemorates that particular right. moment. Yeah. Right. So you can have a but very quickly now, Philip came on the next week. I think Jack came on, and Deanna, you were there from very early enough on. So there was, again, with some, we all got together. And what was your vision for today? I know you were talking a little bit about education, but what did you imagine it was going to look like at that time? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, in our first full year, we had a few problems with certain individuals that held us up for a few months. But once we got running towards the end of 06 and early 07, we got started on maybe education, I think, was number one. Because the support group was looking after itself, and we didn't want to get too involved. Under Tenny, though, we did get a support group set up in Cork as well, very quickly. I'd say that was end of 06, early 07. And then we turned our attention to the education issue. And at the time, the first port of call we felt for any trans person was the GP. And most GPs knew nothing about us. They didn't know where to go, they didn't know what to do with it, nothing. So we produced a leaflet for, to be sent to all GPs. And the Equality Authority very kindly um, gave us, uh, I remember, 10,000 euros to, to bring in this project. Now that was Tenet's sole budget in 2007. So we got envelope, or we got, we got these leaflets printed out and sent by post to every single GP in the country. But we managed to have about four grand left over, so I managed to persuade the Equality Authority that we could spend that. We had a weekend away in early January 08, and that was fantastic. That brought about I think well, 40 or 50. Yeah. Mulligar. It's down in Dungar. Dungar. Exactly. Yeah. And like the, the one individual I remember, a trans woman, had never actually been dressed as herself until that weekend. And she was in her mid-50s, she, but she'd never been out anywhere other than her own flat where she would be able to dress as herself. And that was very touching, you know, and that was only in 2008. <laughs> you know, it, it is amazing. Eight years ago. So, but Tenny just took off then, but then we were fighting for um, money, and uh, we got that, thankfully, from um, Atlantic Philanthropies. And then I stepped back for reasons we won't go into for two or three years. <laughs> and Tenny is now where it is. And now you're back. And I'm back. And come here, what was your, the proudest moment, I suppose, of those early days for you? And just to say, actually, there's a copy, I think, of the GP letter out there in the kind of in that corner. Well, no, that was nice. But I, I, I do remember being particularly touched down in um, Dungarvan by the fact that that lady was able to dress as herself. That that would have been for me one of the biggest moments of those early days. Um, after that, well, we had quite a few. The visit to the president uh, for tea that was quite nice. Um, to feel we derived as to where we'd come from, from the day in the shelter, we were literally hiding. But I remember Claire and I worried as to how we'd say we'd know each other if anybody asked us. Like, who'd ask us? I don't know. But your fear was at that level. And, and, you know, you had to, you know, what was your reason for sitting with this person? And um, to go from that to being given tea by the president of Ireland and Harris and Uthron, that's that was phenomenal. It's incredible how, you know, we've heard kind of that, it's, it's kind of a slow process of kind of slow burn and then fairly quickly that momentum has built. Now, this week, and I am very proud, we've transfusion this week, look at the community we have now. Like, it's phenomenal. I remember there was one particular meeting, the, almost the entire trans community that was active back then, met in my sitting room out in Tala. That wouldn't happen now, which is great. <laughs> yeah. well, and now we have hundreds of people coming through the doors yeah. for trying That's to see. Absolutely them. fantastic. I don't know most of them. Isn't that great for them? <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, but it's it's been a great journey. But I think we've, to many respects, the the the, the old TS, right? The the, the originals. The, we've kind of arrived. And if you're over eighteen and you're that classic trans. We've got our rights and everything else. And there's a lot of work to be done for the kids, and there's a lot of work to be done for, you know, for non-binaries and intersex and all that. And um, what we originally set it up for, yeah, we've succeeded, which I'm very pleased. That and the fact that I think society accepts us now. Definitely come a long way. Yeah. Thank you, Vicky. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose going back that time, I mean, Jesus, you're going back nearly 10 years, isn't you? Nine, 10 years. And um, I remember being down, um, down in Waterford and certainly like really, really strong because it was nothing down there. And I remember buying my first, first laptop and uh, getting into it and learning how to use it and finding things. And then just learning that it was uh, the group and looking at bus timetables and transport and trying to get off. And it was just something that we couldn't do, really, just couldn't do it. Um, and then, like, I accessed at that time uh, a group in Waterford, an LGBT group called SELF. And through that group, we started to look at developing a group in Waterford, and we did develop a group in Waterford, which was very successful for a while, but unfortunately, uh, over recent times, it hasn't been as successful. Um, and then out of that then, I suppose, the more work that I got involved in regard to the volunteer work that I in Waterford, um, this, this position came up in Tenny. And I thought, oh, for fuck's sake, like, I'd never get that, like, you know? Because I, 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 I had no, no background in the year, but I did get it. And um, for the last six and a half years then, I, I've you know, been privileged to work in the position with um, so many wonderful people and so many wonderful families and really, you know, working with the Limerick group, the Cork group, the Waterford group, the Galway groups and really, I think, really the, the, the group that really stood out for, for me and I think it's a group that has made such, such, such a change in Ireland and, and that's transparency and that's the family support group uh, because going back that time you know, I, I just heard so much uh, this evening, you know, going back into people's experiences, whether it's 100 years or 200 years, or whether it's five years or 10 years, and, and the fear and the secrecy uh, that was so much surrounded in it. And then we, we emerged into, into a place where we are now, where that fear and secrecy is becoming less and less because we are forming an understanding as a society and I think we are, we are very much going away from that and I think transparency have been a, a kind of a cornerstone in that because families were speaking about their experiences with their children and people were thinking, because I remember, and I don't want to go on too much, but I remember because I've done some radio work over the years and I remember one of the most harrowing interviews I had was with Afro Radio and it was a live, live radio stream at Afro Radio. And one of the questions they asked me, do I, do I rub my nipples? Uh, this was on live radio that was streamed back. And I really I was threatened to walk out of it. But I said, excuse me, I said, this is a bit insulting. Uh, I said, like, I said, do you know, I said, that there's, there's families in this situation that could be listening to this. And he said, there's families in this situation. He just didn't have an understanding. And again, it goes back to an understanding. He didn't have an understanding. And when we explained about the understanding, he got it, actually. And he offered me a place on the radio station, which I obviously didn't take. But at the same time, it's like um, people come on, on different parts, and people have a different understanding of different differences. And I think, really, that's what we strove to do over the last six and a half years to build the groups. And I, I think that was, was cornerstone for me. And then Vanessa, so you're actually the longest, I'm trying to figure out the way to say this, longest tenny employee, I want to say the oldest, but you know what I mean. Um, I'm longest I'm happy the oldest as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in that time, and you mentioned that in terms of visibility, and I'm struck by the strand again of this invisibility, and in the last few years we've seen an increase of visibility of trans experiences. Of course, visibility in and of itself doesn't mean change, that can actually make people more vulnerable or more on display or whatever. But I wonder if you could say a little bit about your experience in those last six and a half years about how things are changing or what that has actually looked like. Yeah, um could you ask that question again? You kind of asked me about that. That must be it's the Canadian. It's the wine. Yeah. Um, no, I suppose just about just about visibility and how things have changed. Like I remember, even a few years ago, do you remember the former chairperson of Tenny, Martina Kuipers, was oh, on the Jesus. cover of the Irish Sun? Um, I don't have it. Yeah, and so I guess you know. We have the connection. Yes. 
Yeah. So, so just maybe some reflections on that and how it's changed. Yeah, and I think, I, and I remember that. I mean, I was already working with Kenny, I think, a month at that time. And I got a phone call from Sarah, and I don't know if anyone's remember, we had a chairperson. And the headline on, on that wonderful paper, that wonderful foreign paper called The Daily Sun, uh, ran something completely derogatory about her chairperson. And I think, you know, Sarah called me and she asked me would I speak to News Talk, which, which I did. Uh, and people didn't have a f fucking understanding, a fucking clue, to be quite honest. And I think through that and through the, the media work that we've done, I think we've made sense for people. I think we've brought it down to people's levels and we spoke to people where they are. And even though we've had quite a bit of uh, anger and frustration over the situation, I think it was to understand that people just don't understand. And I remember, you know, that conversation with News Talk and then uh, similarly after another while with that, I think it was Brian Welch, TD Mayor or something, said something derogatory again about that uh, healthcare and people accessing healthcare. And uh, he didn't know. He just didn't know. And I think we, we had this conversation on, on the air. And I think after that, he, he did apologize. So again, I think it's like, you can quite easy at times kind of respond quite angrily, quite aggressive, because we're frustrated, because we've been kept down through fear and secrecy for so many years. We've heard so many other transgender people and their families who have lived in fear and lived in secrecy and become more and more frustrated and more and more frustrated with their colleagues. And, and then we have, a, we have a society who didn't have an understanding. So I think from that, I think we're going to have to step, take a step back and think, okay, all right, okay, just hang on to that anger for a while, just shove that anger. And I think that has worked. I think that has brought people around. I think brave and wonderful, wonderful people who have put themselves out there in the media, and others people who haven't put themselves out in the media, and I think we've come such, such a long way in six and a half years. But at the same time, like, we still have such a long way to go. I mean, I was speaking to Natalie earlier on, and she was talking about the numbers in the Gemini have really decreased. And I mean, it, that's, that's obviously a concern. Like, where are these people? You know, where are they? You know, I mean, where are they gone? Like, you know, and, um, you know even with transparency, we, we have 80% of the young people who are identifying as male. So where's the balance? You know, where are the girls going? You know, so that's obviously a concern. You know, so we still have, and, and you know, I mean, we, you know, sometimes we have this thing that we we clap each other on the back, and it's great to clap each other on the back. But I think we're we're only just breaching the surface. Like, you know, we're breaching the surface. We've a lot of work to do. We've done incredible work, but you know, we still have a long way to go. We do indeed, and and Philippa, I suppose, just on that front as well. Um, because obviously Vanessa is still in Tenny, she's still in our folds, she's still doing all of that work. And you've been involved in any co like number of different types of trans activism. And I was thinking about what Claire and Danny said earlier about not being linked in with the LGBT community or the LGB community. And I wondered if you had any reflections about kind of coming full circle or back, because I know you were involved in the marriage equality referendum, you've been involved in trans rights and all of this. Have you had any thoughts about that? particular trajectory or that kind of narrative as part of our community? Well, that's such a long question. I'd have to ask Brian, didn't I? Um, yeah, definitely. My, my, the, the work that Helen and I did, Helen, my wonderful wife over there, um, she, uh, she and I worked a lot with Dublin South West and Catherine's Poem um, in the Yes Equality campaign last year. And I, I think I just want to touch on something that Vanessa said about where are the where are the young people and and where are the you know um, Gemini club the the the, the, the um, where are the trans people going to to Gemini as well and I think in a way it's all we're almost a victim of our own success because society is accepting us now far far more than it was and I think there's no need and even even um, gay bars and and um, like dragging clothes a while back, unfortunately, it was great. Um, you know, because it is, it is becoming, becoming the norm, and there's no reason to actually have to go to, to, to venues like that. And the, the LGB community, they are beginning to get 
trans. They, I think there was always a disconnect between the T and the LGB. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, and I, I do know that, that a lot of T people don't want to even to be part of the LGB. You know, but we, we face common, not the same problems, but we face similar problems um, to do with coming out and to do with visibility and, 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 and being, being out in public and so on. Um, so I suppose in that sense, it's, 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 uh, there, is, there is a disconnect, but there is support there as well. And certainly from, from my involvement with the various um, uh, campaigns and so on, yes, the trans aspect was was certainly um, played down a lot by by the the wider yes equality um, um, groups, uh, but I think they appreciated our our support anyway. And I, I know I know uh, you know privately there were things said to me that that look we we really do appreciate the support that Tenny and and trans people do, but. They had their reasons, and obviously this community is not happy with the reasons that, but maybe we can understand to some degree. And and I suppose just looking forward a little bit, um, Vanessa particularly, do you think things have changed? You mentioned this a bit earlier, and I know you're a very proud Waterfordian woman, but do you think things have changed for people in rural Ireland, or what do we need to do on that front? Yeah, I think I think they have. I think the visibility, funny enough, I was just, you know, it's just um, um, getting ready this morning to, to head up here. And I passed two, two trans women on the street in Waterford now. And things are changing. You just walk and I didn't know any of the two of them. I didn't need to know any of the two of them. Um, because it's, it's their lives. And people are, are moving on with their life. And people are far more accepting. And, I think you know, in in regard to healthcare, in regard to the trainings that we gave, and that we give, and, and like we gave sixty nine trainings to healthcare workers last year, uh, to over two thousand workers, and I think we're building capacity throughout Ireland. Where I would love to see that we don't have this this pie in the sky in in Lachlan's town anymore. That we can go to our GPs and we can be referred on to local services, local regional services for whatever needs we have and we're treated as individuals, not as what we're, we're boxed into. And I think that's, that has been a success. I think that has definitely been a success and I think we, we have to keep pushing uh, to ensure that we have uh, regionalised services and that we have more information on uh, regional media streams as well because I find the regional media streams is, is the key, and this is what people listen to, uh, or listen to people's stories. But I think, yeah, we are emerging, and we're not just emerging in Dublin, where us cultures are, are certainly emerging as well. So it's good to see it, and it's not, a, it's not seen as a big deal anymore. We're kind of like, people are getting over themselves, and you know, and, and it's, it's good to see that. It's good to see that, that Ireland, and you know, it's, in a hundred years, like it's, um, we've come a long way, and maybe just to, to shut up before I go. Um, my my own son was on something on RT2 about three weeks ago, where they spoke about uh, a hundred years since the proclamation, and they spoke about social justice, and it was like, yes, you know, there's a difference. There's our there's our next generation, and they're comfortable with themselves, and they have friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or queer and they're comfortable in themselves and people don't have to go off into different silos and people just can be part of who they are and perfect in human diversity and absolutely up to caution. So, all good. I just uh, want to compliment Tanya and Broden particularly about the... Um, and Tanya and me... No, I'll just say Tanya. Um, about the gender recognition um, uh, session that we held in DCU last, last week. And what struck me there is just what Vanessa said about the young people. God, we us oldies were were outnumbered by by the youth. There were there were teenagers, early twenties, um, of and trans asterisk is often used as the as the broad term for, for defining trans. So it's it's a it's a diverse community, and that was so evident 
in GCU last, last week, and I, I'm, I'm sure you noticed that, Brian, it was wonderful. Um, I suppose that the one thing I'd say, though, at the moment is, yes, things are great. Not perfect, but they are so much better than they were. However, I do feel that there's a balance, and or, or, or a peak that we could easily reach fairly quickly before the pendulum swings, and it could, with the amount of right-wing um, hate out there at the moment, in, in the States and in Europe, and even it's showing up in Britain as well during this, um, the Brexit de debate. And I just feel that it's so important, so incumbent on the community to keep, keep working and to support Tenny and to support local LGBT organisations because it is a danger that if we don't stop educating, we don't stop pushing for rights and acceptance and so on, that in fact the pendulum could swing very much against us again. And I suppose it's a, it's a really cautionary note in the sense that rights can always be rolled back. And I think, and not to overstate perhaps tonight, but I do think it's really important that the way we can stand against this is if we're united. And I think a way to be united is to ensure that we have uh, kind of a bond as a community. We're very different, we have different backgrounds and histories, um, you know, we have different political viewpoints, but certainly we can come together to ensure that our rights for everyone are, are granted or achieved. And I suppose just to say on that note, and to thank you both for the work that you've done to do that and continue to do, um, and it's obviously a conversation that's going to keep going, but I do want to thank you both, and can we give them a big round of applause? Thank you. So, we're nearing the end of the show, um, but last but not least, we have three young, brilliant activists who I'd like to call up on the stage, uh, Torin Glavin, Daniel Zagorski, and Sam Blankensee. And I suppose what we want to do is continue this conversation very much, so hopefully I'm not going to go toppling off the back, um, and that there's room for everyone, but welcome, welcome. Can we give them a big round of applause? So thank you, the three of you, for being here. Um, I suppose what I really wanted to kind of kick it off with you all was, I guess, a reflection. So you've obviously got a lot of information. Um, I imagine a lot of history that you didn't know before. And I guess I, I was hoping you could reflect a little bit about what that might mean to you, or what that means as to young trans activists. I think the fact that uh, even somebody who's really interested in history, the fact that this is the first time I've actually been able to hear a lot of trans history, it's not exactly easy to find, it's not exactly spoken about a lot. Um, so it's really impactful to actually be able to hear it. And the fact that we've got to a point where we're going, uh, why weren't we counted in? And can we like write that history now? Because we've been forgotten. Um, I know that also it, it was quite striking that uh, because I can literally go out and um, we set up a few years ago Trans Guys Ireland, which is an online uh, group for trans masculine people. And there's 180 of us in that group. And the vast majority of us are going to remain uh, active. And yet, I find that trying to find somebody who's 10 years older than me, or somebody who came out 10 years ago, is, is very difficult. Um, or even 15 years ago, is almost impossible. So I think that has changed a lot, and I think that really did strike me tonight because you know, there, there are so few trans masculine people that are still visible. Um, it, it's interesting because if you go back, way back, you see Albert Cashier and you know, people who are identified as male and if their life is male, um, but you don't hear very many stories, or we, even tonight we didn't hear any stories of non-binary people really. Um, it tends to be mostly trans women or women or female identified people who we're talking. And I wonder in terms of, for us, say, on the trans masculine spectrum, trying to find your space in history, and you just spoke a bit about that. I don't know, Daniel, if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, it's always great to see that trans people have been around for so, so long, because, you know, sometimes you do hear people saying, well, oh, it's a new invention, people are just 
coming up with new names for things and coming up with identities. No, you know, we've been here for hundreds of years, and I mean, we've probably been there beyond beyond that. But obviously, it's hard to find that kind of information. But seeing that, it's great because there's representation. We've done great stuff in the past, and we're doing great stuff now. And especially, I think for transmasculine people, when you come out, you don't really see a lot of older people. So it's kind of hard to envision your future, especially if you're at the early stages of your transition. So to have those people to like look up to and see that oh, you know, they're living their life, they're doing their thing, and they're fine, is very encouraging and very good and extremely important for people to see. Not even just for trans people, but for other people as well. Like it's not just a phase for young people. It happens, and then you know that's your life. You know, you go on and you live a great life, hopefully. <laughs> And Taryn, I suppose I know because you obviously work at Tenny and through ITSA, and like listening to people talking over you know the last forty years, does any of that resonate with you, or do you feel like things are different for people, the same, or people struggling with the same issues? Or, um, I suppose I always find it really striking just how different it is. Like listening to Claire and listening to Vicky, and like Tenny hired me when I was twenty-one. It's just such a young age, and we're seeing people come out in their teens and individuality belong to like. They're all under 18 now, and there's 30 of them every week, all jumping around in Parliament Street. And it's just the, the age people are coming out is ridiculous. Like, I don't think when Tenny was set up, they thought in 10 years they'd be hiring a 21 year old and a 22 year old a few weeks later. And um, so I think the age is, is a huge thing. People are coming out much earlier. We're kind of going to lose that narrative. And it's kind of sad we're going to lose that narrative of older trans people who have had families and have been married and been quite happy and had kids because we're going to kind of move away from that, I think. Um, and that will be an interesting kind of difference to see where we, we do come out much earlier and it will be kind of interesting to come back in another 40 years and see where we've gone and what we've done because I think our story will be very different to Claire's or Ricky's or someone like that. I don't know if that makes sense, I hope so. <laughs> and in terms of I guess the visibility as well because you know again I was struck by uh, you know everything being very secretive um, and there being a real shift and like trans issues are in the media all the time now. Some good, a lot of decent, mediocre, and some poor, but do you think that there is a big shift, or even in the last few years of you being out, or are you kind of being in the trans community, do you see a big shift, and what do you think that's going to look like? Um, so I guess, for me, I've never seen a trans person on TV, as far as I remember. It, there just weren't people like living authentically in the media, it, or at least that, or at least people that weren't being sensationalized, people that weren't uh, having a shock horror surgery sort of idea plastered on on uh, uh, tabloids, like channels and things like that. Um, but I know that like, when I first went into the media, it was terrifying because, you know, no, as far as I was aware, at 18, nobody talked about this. This wasn't something that was in the newspapers. This was only just starting. I was seeing, starting to see some of the work that Tenny was doing, but, you know, it didn't really get talked about in Ireland. Um, then fast forward on four, four years, almost five years, and there are younger people who are kind of itching to get into the media. And we're kind of going, okay, so, you know, you're sure about this? And they're like, yeah, of course, like, why wouldn't I go in? And I'm like, this is brilliant. Because, like, everyone says this to me, like, I can't believe you're, like, 22 and have done all this media stuff. I'm like, yeah, but that kid's 16 and they can't wait to get into it. Um, and now, even in recent times, the fact that um, I am able to now use uh, both they, them pronouns and he, him pronouns at work. Like, Tenny is going to be using they, them pronouns when they're referring to me. Um, and I'm going to get to start talking about being non-binary in the media. And that's really exciting because I didn't think that I'd be able to be open about that part of my identity. It wasn't something that even when I started to come out that I thought that would ever be public because, you know, nobody understood. I think that's starting to, to change now. Oh, sorry. And, and kind of on that point, I think it's... With you're saying, as you're saying, like young people are coming out and, and they want to kind of be in the media earlier and earlier. And I think we need to kind of be careful that we don't let the sensationalization of trans people become the younger generation because we have seen it in, in recent months and years where younger people will go, Oh, yeah, I want to be in the media and I'll do this. And they get used by the media. So, like, as important it is that everyone's story is told, we have to kind of watch the media, make sure they're not 
using the younger trans people because they will so quickly use it and we've seen it throughout the decades of using trans people and I think the older trans community has gotten that bit more mature but now it's the teenagers that they're kind of targeting which is worrying but it's fantastic that they're there we just have to be very careful of, of what's being said and who's actually asking the questions which not to put a negative spin on it <laughs> no but it's very true and, and history has told us that that is in fact the case I know when I first moved here there were we get requests for media all the time and there were just a handful of people so when you say that I'm really struck every single one of you have done national media of some variety of print, broadcast, whatever and that's incredible to me in that short a period of time that there's so many people and so many more kind of chomping at the bit I guess, and, and you kind of touched on this in your bit Sam but when we're looking forward because I think this is really useful to kind of look backwards but as we're moving forward like what are the key emerging issues that you see, um, that you think TENI should work on, or the trans rights movement's going to be dealing with. You spoke a bit about non-binary, but are there other issues that you see that you think, you know, we've had this great run, um, where we've got, come a long way, but obviously we're not there yet. Yeah, I mean, even just on the subject of media, like you were saying, it does get centralized even nowadays. And I think I got a question from someone once that I would, they even said that it would be great to see like a documentary, like a day in the life of someone trans. Or like, there was a TV show, I think it was in England, and it was like, My Transsexual Summer, something like this. And every time someone says that to me, I'm like, but you know, that's going to be a really boring documentary. On my average day, I rarely get out of bed. <laughs> I sit on my laptop all day. So I think the biggest issue is kind of education. And we have a lot more visibility, and we have a lot more opportunities to be in the media and kind of um, dominate the narrative, as in we provide the narrative. But there's still a lot of misconceptions like getting out to like rural Ireland and getting that information to schools and workplaces and then getting policies to be implemented so trans people don't have to be discriminated against in places where we don't usually reach to. So I think education is a huge thing because if people know the issues and if they know how to deal with them, nobody will be discriminated against. If you're a decent person, you're not going to specifically discriminate against that person. So yeah, education. It's funny because that is, you know, it's something Vicky was talking about, it's something Vanessa's talked about, like, this is still a, th a strand of, in all of our work, and we certainly aren't going to stop now. I know that what I'm working on at the moment in, in, in Tenny is, is all around mental health, and for me, that is something that is more and more becoming apparent that we're going to need to work on, and work on now, um, rather than just... Uh, I, I find that I've, it's so easy to find statistics on trans people's mental health, but it's so difficult to find ways that we can start to improve our mental health while the society is still the way it is, and although it's improving, I think that acting and, and making sure that we have the support mechanisms that, are, that need to be in place, in place, and that we have uh, resources on mental health and and that people start getting trained as to how to improve trans mental health. I think that's something that we need to, need to do and, and need to get done. Um, and something I, I don't know that I would kind of find important is, is even looking at employment because obviously we know a huge amount of trans people are unemployed and that's going through all of the generations and it's one of the things that kind of connects every age group of trans people is this huge unemployment that, that occurs within the community and the poverty. So I, myself, I think that's something that we really, really need to look at as a community going forward and how we're going to support everyone and we're going to make sure employers are supportive and they know what's happening because it's easy to say we're not being discriminated against and yes, we can go to the shop and buy whatever clothes you want, but at the end of the day, if you go in for an interview and you hear back a no, you can't really question that no and it could be part of your presentation. And I know myself, I had huge issues in my workplace and it was they did a lot of things that were quite terrible and I didn't argue at the time because I didn't know I could. So I, I think workplaces and poverty is a huge thing. Not to be negative on the third point, but it is something that, that will be looked at and we do get quite a few calls around that kind of issue. So it, workplaces are very important as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the theme of all of this is to kind of, and, and all of Transfusion really, is to celebrate our community, acknowledge the positive bits, to think about you know how we've come together and the, and the great, I guess, uh, achievements we've had certainly not forgetting all of the bits that we haven't done yet and that we still need to do. So on that note, can we get a very big round of applause for these brilliant accountants? Thank you.
So we've come to the end, um, and I guess I just wanted to say a few uh, quick words to kind of wrap it up. And I guess for me, um, you know, we talk so much about trans visibility and we talk about trans rights, and in a lot of ways, particularly in the media, it's portrayed as a new phenomenon. And we know from tonight that that is absolutely not the case, that we have hundreds of years in Ireland um, of trans experiences, of trans identities, and I think that's so incredibly important that we're talking about trans and gender variant people and that we're digging up more and more stories because I think it contributes to our kind of collective memory and it really fuels our ability to kind of keep fighting. And we know that trans people have existed across cultures and throughout time. So I'm so delighted that we're able to launch the uh, archive tonight. And I'm so delighted that as a community, we can come together and find strength from each other and from each other's courage um, because I know I'm personally so I don't know, inspired by the fact that, you know, Danny and Claire and Natalie and Marianne and Vicky and I'm forgetting Philippa and Vanessa all were kind of out on the front lines um, well before I ever came on the stage and, and well before I think a lot of people in the room. And it's really important that we remember that we remember that we stand on the backs of giants. And there's many people who were mentioned today who didn't get a chance to come up here. But I also want to thank each and every one of them for the role that they played, some more visible, some less visible, but all incredibly important in terms of how far we've come as a community. Um, and so as we move forward to the next phase of our struggle and movement, I just want to give a big round of applause to everyone in the room and thank you all. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not quite done. And um, just to say, to wrap up, uh, and then you're all free to drink a bit of wine, but we still have uh, three more events. So. Uh, we still have three more events as part of Transfusion. Tomorrow at Outhouse, we're going to screen the film Tangerine with the Sex Workers Alliance of Ireland. It's at 7.30. It'd be great if people could come along. We'll have a little bit of a discussion about sex work and trans sex workers. On Saturday, we have the big crowning jewel of Transfusion, which has got to get it out of my head. That's going to be here. We'll have performances, singing, poetry. It's brilliant. It's one of the best nights. Uh, our best uh, events that we do in the year. So I would encourage everyone to come out. And then finally, we have a picnic on Sunday to kind of debrief and just chill out and have a nice uh, calm time in Phoenix Park, which is at 2 p.m. So there's programs sticking around, but we would encourage you all to come out. And thank you again. Have a great night.